you know it's like a skin suit dude i'm gonna be honest like we, we got we're on private right now i really believe the novus ordo mass was designed to condition people to compromise so like I, i've said this before like when when the mandate came down i don't if i was not going to the traditional mass i don't think i would have stood up against the mandate like i think i would have listened to francis and been like well maybe i do have a moral imperative to take this thing and i might have gotten it but because i went to the traditional mass there's something that just makes you fervorous for the faith like it, it, there's something that makes you really like like have zeal for your faith and I don't think I'd have had it without it. Like, I really think that the Novus Ordo was meant to condition people to accept compromise. No, I mean, it's literally, it's a mass that's designed for compromise, for theological compromise with Protestants. That's literally the whole purpose of it. And I stopped defending that system a long time ago um, because I really do believe this. <clears throat> I think that you have to get to a point. Wait, but, all right. So wait, Jacob, I, I don't think it was... Maybe it wasn't made for that reason. It was made as a compromise to Protestants, but it's a byproduct of it. Like, just look at all of the look at all of the people who attend the Novus Ordo trying to justify the things that are happening in the church right now. Like, you see it. They they all like when these things happen. They're just they 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 want to just. I, I think so many people that attend the Novus Ordo think they have a reverent Novus Ordo because they don't know what real reverence is. Like I don't I until you are at a traditional Latin mass for a long time, it's almost like you don't it it all right. If you go to a traditional mass repeatedly for a long time, then you go back to a Novus Ordo, that's when you see it. Do the uh, I think his father Ripperger he, he gave a challenge. I think it's at two or three months, I forget, but it's some short time period like that where he says go exclusively to the traditional Latin mass for like two or three months and then go back to one new mass and you'll see. Maybe someone could give the argument that um, the people condition you in the places that you are in, right? That maybe there's just all of these kind of quote rad trads over here. And so they can condition you to think this way. And then you go over here and then there's the Nova Sordo and they condition you to think this way. I say objectively look at the missiles themselves and look at what the revisor said. There is mountains of evidence to, to suggest that the purpose of the Novus Ordo Mass was to make a theological compromise to dialogue with Protestantism. It was trying to remove this idea of propitiatory sacrifice, the idea that the sacrifice appeases the wrath of God due to our sin, that we need to remove this idea because it is a stumbling block to the Lutheran understanding of a sacrifice of praise, and that if we do this, we'll all kind of become buddy-buddy, we even saw it became so buddy buddy that there, <clears throat> that um, the Anglican the Anglican Church at Walsingham uses the original 1969 missile, like it, it's the Anglican Church. They use you can watch it today. I'll, if you want, I'll send you the link sometime. They do the original 1969 missile, and when they're asked about it, they'll say, "Well, there's nothing in here that's objectable to our faith." Right? Um, do you want to bring Jacob on? Hop on the video and share my research with you. I mean, if it's an, if it's an MA thesis, maybe we should schedule a whole show on this because uh, uh, eventually I got to eat dinner. Um, <laughs> so Jacob, I, I will have you on, Jacob, because I don't want to be I don't want if I'm missing something. I don't like I'm not stubborn in my ways. Like if I can be corrected on something, I'll be corrected on it. So, Jacob, if you follow me on Twitter or anything, shoot me a DM or like figure out a way to even message me on. If you're now in the locals now, just shoot me a message in locals. And um, I'm not like a hardened person. Like I want to know, I want to, I don't want to speak about erroneous things. Here's what I know. If you ever watched the Michael Davies talk about the, uh, about Henry VIII and what happens with Cranmer and stuff, like what you see is when Lex Orande, Lex Credende is such a real thing that what happens is they change, they take the Latin away, they change the liturgy in England, but they don't change doctrine right away. But after a, a generation of these people getting used to this new liturgy, then they can start switching and playing around with doctrines. And that's really what you saw with the Novus Ordo is at first the doctrine stayed the same. They didn't play around with it. Like they tried to get through contraception and stuff. And St. Paul, the uh, St. St. Pope John, uh, St. Pope Paul, the sixth wrote Humani Vitae and he stuck, you know, he put his foot down about it and, 
but now we're a generation or two removed from it. And once that liturgy has settled in, it's just, it's, it's not celebrated reverently anyway. I mean, maybe if you had the St. John Canty as Novus Ordo celebrated universally, even maybe that. Is, even if huh? it is, so even if it is celebrated reverently, that it does, it almost doesn't matter because it's like when you go back to the Ottaviani intervention and they complain about the, the whole missile in and of itself, many people know that they changed the definition, right, to a more orthodox definition in the new mass missile. But they did not change the substantial nature of what they were still critiquing in the missile. The problem is, is that the missile in and of itself, in its rubrics and in its prayers, is it's not a – I will never say – and hear me right. I will never say the Novus Ordo is heretical. I'm not making that claim. I'm not saying that the Novus Ordo is invalid in and of itself. I'm not making those claims. But what I think the Novus Ordo does is it veils truths that are essential to the Catholic faith to where it's like, okay – are they present? Yes, in the strict sense of the word, but you have to go through a lot of chopping. And the purposes of a Catholic right is to express the Catholic belief to the faithful. Not to hide it. Yeah, not hide it. And so therefore, when we ask ourselves the question of Lex, or when we think of the statement Lex Arande, Lex Credendi, I'll use an extreme ex analogy to prove what we're saying. Let's say, I'll give you two. If we were to change the Our Father from Our Father to Our Mother, we would obviously have over time, uh, you know, we could try to say all we want about what this means, um, but we could, we would have a breakdown of what that means. But then if we were to just say something very neutral, oh, great spirit one, right, at the beginning of the article. Or, or even if you say about the Trinity, the, the creator, the redeemer, and the sanctifier. Yeah, it's like. I've heard that. That's actually something I've heard. The creator, the redeemer, and the sanctifier. You're taking something away from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I've yeah, seen them do that. Yeah, it's like that statement isn't obviously heretical because that is true. But the problem is, is that it starts to veil and make ambiguous the reality. And so that's here's, – here's just the question for most of the Catholic viewers. When you go to the Mass, regardless of whether it's the Novus Ordo or the traditional Mass or even an Eastern Rite, when you go to the Mass, are you really aware, not just kind of abstractly in your mind, but are you really aware that you are at Calvary – and you are joining your intention of all the sins you've done throughout this week. Think of all the stuff that you've brought to confession, right? All the lying, all the stealing, all the lusting, all the pride, all the wickedness, every word that you've said, that you've now brought this to the mass so that the priest can make a sacrifice because God's wrath is perturbed, <laughs> put it lightly, at your sin, right? Do you think that? And then if we take that reality, we actually should ask the question, well, then how should we act? We need to be reverent. We need to recognize whose presence we are in. We need to kneel down. We need to actually understand that this is a moment by which the entire earth is, is in an orbit for, that this is the moment of moments. But then to see that and say, you know, sin, wrath of God, that makes God seem they like take a divine. It all out. All that language is removed. Yeah, it's like that makes God seem like a divine child abuser. Maybe we should just say, okay, yeah, sin's not great, but sin is just man's dignity being wounded. And I'm not saying that's false, right? That's There's truth in that. But when you invert the order of what's important, when you veil important truths, Satan oftentimes, again, he doesn't straight up contradict the Lord. He just wants to veil it enough for you, right? Do the rubrics of the TLM allow for the altar to be separated from the wall, celebrated versus populum, or without a tabernacle in the sanctuary? Okay. So there's a, there's a couple of books that actually have recently come out upon this. One the SSPX has put out, I think it's just called Freestanding Altars. Don't quote me exactly on that. Um, but uh, when it comes to the, the actual rubrics, no, you don't have to be uh, actually attached to the wall, if my memory is correct, because uh -oh. when we look at... What'd you say? No, you froze for a sec. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. When it comes to the actual rubrics? When it comes to the actual rubrics, again, take this, what I'm saying with a grain of salt. I don't believe that it's actually strictly that it needs to be against the wall because you see, um, especially in Roman basilicas, many freestanding altars and celebrated versus populum. Again, I mean, it kind of is a little bit video of, of Padre Pio celebrating versus populum. Yeah, it depends on what you mean by that because it's like objectively speaking, like you're supposed to face canonical east. So like Yeah. So it could be versus populum if the priest is still facing the Orient. Yeah, and then without the tabernacle in the sanctuary, I have heard this argument that again, because you see the you see the liturgy develop 
tabernacles start becoming on the main altar and very important. And so people will say, you know, what's right, but, but Jacob, here's the thing. Just because the rubric rubrics allow for it, you don't see it. So like, look, look, I'll give you an example. Okay. So at my, uh, the, at the diocesan Latin mass I go to during Christmas time, they have poinsettias all over the altar. So the priest will celebrate versus popular in the, the traditional Latin mass. I have no problem with that. That's not the issue though. The issue is that because the Novus Ordo allows it, every priest takes advantage of it because the, the, the Novus Ordo allows the rubrics so much wiggle room. You find so much variation between every single different mass you go to. So we were talking about this uh, on the, on the show the other day. It's like, what happens is because there's so much variation between every single Novus Ordo. Now you have a progressive parish and you have a, conservative parish so people now no longer go to the parish that's actually supposed to be their geological parish and they start church hopping like protestants till they find a conservative novus ordo parish now now i'm at the point where i'm driving an hour to go to a traditional latin mass this shouldn't be like it, it just shouldn't be this way it's causing ghettoization amongst catholics where you're getting where now we're in this war and there's a de facto schism because so many progressive parishes have been formed through this process because of the liturgy. So you might be technically right, Jacob, and I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying because the rubrics allow for it, every priest is taking advantage of that. And, and every Novus Ordo Mass becomes almost a, a, a show about the priest. And it well, becomes... And, and he's, he's mainly referring to the, um, to the Latin Mass. So he's asking a question to the like a, a old school Latin mass rubrics allow for freestanding altars, tabernacles in the sanctuary, these types of things they do. Right. Because they recognize the legitimate, like potential pastoral need. Like this church was built before it, there was a, an altar that was attached to the wall. These types of things. There's obviously a historical development when you see the tabernacle eventually becoming in the center. And that's good because it's fostering Eucharistic devotion. The problem though, is, is that when you look at the new mass missile rubrics in and of themselves, they specifically talk about detaching the altar from the wall. Why? So that it can implement a, the meal setting. So they right. okay. So so right there, right that right. So like the whole understanding of what we're doing at mass in the Novus Ordo, it, it has become so. Look, and there is something true about this. Like we are gathering around the Father's table for a meal. Like there is something to that. That's why it's like you can't say it's like wrong. But like you were just saying before, like all these things are like the technically right. Like, OK, so how do you know you are part of the father's family? When you get baptized, you receive the father's name at baptism, the father, son and Holy Ghost. How do we know with the father's family? Because we go to his table every week and we gather around the father's table. This is how you know you're the father of a family. So there is an aspect of a communal nature to the Eucharist. Now, but what point have we gotten to? We've gotten to the point now where. Cardinal Supic won't allow Eucharistic adoration because that takes away from the communal nature of the Eucharist in his mind that we can't do processions in Chicago anymore because it takes away from the communal nature of the Eucharist because that's how warped his theology has gotten from the Novus Ordo Mass. It starts with the Mass. You know, it starts with the Mass and it starts with this new mentality because, again, when we look back at something like Humani Generis by Pius XII, when he's condemning the Nouvelle Theologie, one of the things that he talks about, the SSPX actually has some very good videos on this specific subject, but one of the things that he condemns is this idea that sacrifice, that God's justice and sin, that all of these natures are starting to be kind of understood in different ways that fundamentally contradict um, the the nature of what traditional Catholic theology has said. So it's like this. When we look at sin as an example, is sin an injustice against God and, or a, a, a degradation of man's dignity? Technically, both, both is correct. Both, yeah. Both. But there's obviously an importance of one over the other because God is our creator. He's infinitely greater than us, et cetera, et cetera, right? So if we focus, though, all of our time on one or the other, there can, of, of course, be like a certain degradation of the other truth. There has to be a proper ordering, though, still of understanding. So, of course, there is a true sense in which, as you said, we're gathered around the Father's table to receive of him. But the problem is, is that's not the primary purpose of the right. Mass. The right. Mass is you owe God justice because of your sin and also just because you're a created being of him who's reliant on him. 
And you by yourself can never give back to God the justice that is owed. And so therefore, we need to make sure that the mass is going to reflect this idea of the sacrificial system. Sacrosanta Concilium refers to the altar as a meal table and God's word, pretty sure. Well, see, this is the thing, though. What is the motivation behind that language? Because we can, in a true sense, say, as you said, right, the meal table of God's word. There is a true sense in which you can say that. But then there's also a very false way that you can say that. Because right, which is why Archbishop Lefebvre signed that document off, right? Like, yeah. so, so like we, like there is a hermeneutic where you could work this properly, which is why Pope Benedict was always trying to uh, uh, urge the hermeneutic of continuity. It's just look at where we are now. Like it's, it, I, there could possibly like, you really could see all the documents of Vatican II in a way that are understood through tradition. But what's happened now is they've just completely abandoned any semblance of trying to do that and they've made it a hermeneutic of rupture look where we are look look where we are we're actually debating in the church the potentiality of allowing in certain diocesan context blessings of same-sex unions was that anywhere on the minds of the conservative the orthodox fathers of vatican ii the the writers of sacrosanctum Concilium. so sacrosanctum Concilium, it's very conservative right it's headed by anibal bunini and so this is the thing anibal bunini guy who writes and i can't say writes but let's just say oversees soccer song concilium same guy who oversees the con the concilium team afterward the problem is that while soccer song to concilium says very very many beautiful and true things about the liturgy it's ambiguous enough to where all of these positions on retaining latin and gregorian chant has pride of place eventually when you get down to paul the sixth he says yeah for for the mission's sake we're gonna have to degradate and get rid of all this we have literally the popes in, in like a five-year time span who are now going against the teachings of Vatican II in a certain sense, right? And that's the problem, is that there is no more continuity on a real practical level anymore. And yes, I it, think, it, again, the only way that we can go back to this is proper worship. The only way, wait, what did you say? Yeah, the only way that we can go back to a semblance of like true Catholicity, and this is, I think we talked about this the last time I was on the show, talking about like Matt Fry brad's question of like what's the future of the nova sordo and they yeah. were asking like yeah if we were to all go at orientum we'd have like a mass exodus in the church which goes to show you where people's hearts are it's on participation it's not on the sacrifice that's given to god if that's the case but we gotta get i'm not saying go back to the 1950s i'm saying let's go back to the 1150s in the yeah. sense <laughs> we solid catholic theology we need strong Thomism reintroduced into the lifeblood of catechesis into life. We need scholasticism to show back up. I mean, bro, back in the day, like if you go back and you read those old 1940s and 50s and even before manuals, they're just straight up attacking every false belief ever. And they're attacking and the things we're seeing today. They're no, yeah, they're debunking. <clears throat> this stuff long before it came into in, into into the uh you know <laughs> the semblance of thought of some of these people but then i just want to ask doing jacob is this your first time catching one of our shows uh, i'm just curious i don't i don't know if i've ever seen you in the chat before is this, is this your first avoiding babylon show that you've ever seen but that, go my, ahead nick he'll answer this is my first avoiding <laughs> babylon <laughs> <laughs> nick i gotta be honest man i have so much fun when you come on dude like legit so much fun when you i can talk to you i mean i know you gotta go eat but like i i love that you you've been coming on I'm, you're gonna be gone for a month right yeah i'll be gone for a month but when i come back um definitely i'll be happy to come on to talk about the uh the experience because so i'm going and i'm actually making a like a full feature film this is not like a normal traditional thomist episode this is going to be a legitimate film a legitimate movie that i'm putting for free out there it's going to be um, on my show, Meaning of Catholic, 1 Peter 5, I think we're going to try to do some uh, some like large communal streams and stuff like that on Meaning of Catholic. Um, but it's going to be on those three platforms. And what it's going to be is it's going to be me going to a very beloved place, Clear Creek Abbey in Oklahoma. This is my seventh time going. I've been going there for a couple of years now. And I'll be staying for 30 days and 30 nights, and I'll be reading through the whole of the Summa, which I've read large sections of it, but I've never just read it cover to cover. And basically what I'm going to be doing is explaining through large sections of it, but then also talking about it in the context of where theology needs to be done, monasticism, with the traditional mass, with the traditional office surrounded, with penance and these types of things. And then you're going to see the transfer. I, again, I don't know what's going to happen, but you're going to see the transformation of me on day one. By the end of day 30, we'll just see kind of what happens. But Are you doing your own filming or do you have somebody coming with you to film? 
I uh, both, yeah. So I'll be doing a lot of my own, but I'll also be having a friend who's going to be staying up there the whole time. They're also going to be filming a good amount of it with me. Um, we're going to bring cameras. We're going to bring audio. We're going to do all kinds of fun stuff. And the, and the Abbott's okay with all this? Yeah, Abbott's cool with it. Um, I mean, a lot of it's just going to be even shot in my room, you know, just me kind of going over things. But I'm going to be filming quite a bit of these things. And um, it, it ties into what we're talking about because Lex Arande, Lex Credendi, I cannot picture myself doing an insane feat like yeah a 25 year old how are you spending your summer oh you know going to a traditional monastery to read through the whole summa just your average like, day it shows like, that you actually do really love the catholic faith it's like and, and and to see a young convert like you is so um like it's just so ins oh, man I, I i could like because especially because when the when you told the story about how your first encounter with Catholicism was that Novus Ordo that was so scandalous to you that you were like this this isn't what I'm reading about like this isn't the faith that I'm it didn't it didn't connect for you and then when you found that first traditional mass that that you were like ah oh, here it is and then to go from there to now you're spending thirty days at Clear Creek Abbey Monastery is so awesome so so awesome yeah let me grab this real quick and I'll show you real quick hold on give me one second. Yeah, yeah, do you think? Yeah, so like, I mean, Rob couldn't make it tonight, and I'm like, all right, who can I get come on with me? I was, I was gonna actually, I was gonna ask Alex or uh, Adrian, and if Nick couldn't come on, so Alex, you're gonna, you're gonna do a show with me one night, but uh, Adrian too. So, but just to hear a young kid like have this kind of passion that he's gonna go spend 30 days in a monastery is such a cool thing. So here, here goes to show you what I'm saying. Um... So again, I'm not trying to say this in the context of brag. This actually. Nick, what is the OP in your name? Uh, order of Preachers. So I'm a third order Dominican. <clears throat> I'm a third order Dominican with the SSPX Dominican community that's based out of <clears throat> southern France. I don't ask you to pronounce the French town's name. <laughs> I'm still I'm still Texan. Um, but uh, so here, this actually links into the Latin Mass that we've been talking about. So here's my copy of the Summa right here three massive volumes i'm somehow going to read 100 pages a day right this massive amount but one of the things that i'm trying to prove with this is that <clears throat> this is not normal this is definitely something that i feel like god has put on my heart to do is to know the faith that's been divinely revealed to mankind but i only know that i would have gotten here <clears throat> because of that first experience with the latin mass that i had back in 2020 there's no, there's not, I mean, I see there's many good people who go to the Nova Sordo. This is not me attacking Nova Sordo Catholics, but I just don't see the reality of if your day in, day out experience of the liturgy <clears throat> is priests not chanting, just looking at you, saying some stuff, you respond to him, Betty Sue's handing out communion, everyone's just dressed in the same general normal clothes. I mean, the, my, for, <clears throat> my experiences of the Nova Sordo, as you said, they were scandalous. I, I also went for a very brief amount of time. I didn't go to masses really there, but I remember going to the uh, the University Catholic Center, and I'd see Catholics. They'd show up in their pajamas for mass. They'd show up in like just this very scandalous stuff for mass. That's not Catholicism. And when I say not no. Catholicism, I don't mean that they're not Catholics. I don't mean that the mass doesn't have graces or anything, but I'm saying Catholicism in the sense of the faith that our ancestors practiced, the faith of St. Thomas, right? This is not that faith. I want to know that faith. It's like I said on Pines with Aquinas a long time ago. I said, I will risk life and limb. I will lose family. I will lose friends. I will lose the shirt on my back. But as long as I have the truth, that's all that I need. It has to come back to truth. I believe St. Thomas, using the scriptures and the Catholic faith, has the truth. It is the true system. Um, and then the traditional mass is what inspires it. So going to a place like this and getting to spend, getting to have two masses, two traditional Latin masses every day. I don't, Anthony, sometimes oh, wow. you just need to take a week off. You need to be like, wife, kids, I'm taking you guys a week off. I'm going to go do this. When you come down, bro, <clears throat> you get up at, you get up at four 30 every morning, right? You go have two of the divine offices, old school Martins and old school louds back to back. Right. So you have like, 30 monks all chanting together and then when it's time for louds you have all the rest of the monks come so it's like 60 monks now all facing each other once all the divine offices are in all chanted in latin all very slow after that you go to the private low masses in the crypt so there's like wow. 20 20 low masses completely silent Simul simultaneously simultaneously going, on. simultaneously going on you're it's lit by candlelight and you're in a crypt like it's just amazing and then once you're done with that, you see all the monks. They're just kneeling on the hard ground for like 20 minutes in Thanksgiving, 
right? They're just praying. And then you go to, pr you go to the next office, right? <clears throat> the office of prime at eight o'clock. And then you work throughout the day. You do your things at 10 o'clock. You have the office of terrace. And then you have a high mass, a solemn high mass every single day. The monks who have already been to mass, they now come together as a community to have the sacrifice of the mass again. And yeah, they're not, they're not, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, co, <laughs> they're, they're just going to part like to actually go to mass. Yeah, they're not having communion a second time. They're just going to be there. They're going to be there with the community, and then you know that continues throughout the day. In the middle of the day, you have the office of sex. Then you have the office of non. Then in the evening, vespers, and then finally in the e very in the in the darkness, right late into the evening, you have compline. It's lit by candles, right? You're and then when you hear the Salve Regina just being chanted in this old solid stone monastery out in the middle of absolutely nowhere, especially when like the rain is going down and it's just lit by candles and everyone's singing Salve Regina. Yeah. That's, that's Catholicism, like yeah. old school Catholicism return. It's nowhere near this idea of, yeah, let's have, you know, uh, a carpet in the sanctuary and uh, the bread basket pattern that I love so much and is dear to my heart. And that's just, let's have Betty Sue, <laughs> Betty Sue run over everything. See, even with Jacob saying, I mean, he's like, so he, so he can think of three Novus Ordo off the top of his head in Vancouver that do it at Orientum, Latin chant, kneeling on the tongue, etc. Okay. I'm in New York. I've been to 20 different parishes on Long Island in New York. Not one of them do that. Okay. This is not the norm. That's the problem. Look, if they would have celebrated the Novus Ordo in that way, maybe it would have you know, not, fine. It's so stumbling block. Yeah. It's just not the, the, nor and I, and I think that it upsets me sometimes when I hear, um, when I hear a person that has a Reverend Novus Ordo there, they defend the Novus Ordo because it's almost like they, they're selfish because like, well, I got my Reverend Novus Ordo. Like, well, I don't know what you guys want. <laughs> it's like, dude, that's not the norm. It's honestly, it is a liturgical wasteland in, in, in 99% of the world. There's so few, no, 99% of the West, because um, uh, Joshua Charles went to Ukraine and he said it was the most reverent Novus Ordo he had ever seen, celebrated by the bishop, no altar girls, at Orientum, communion on the tongue. It was, he said it was almost like, like the way it was intended to be when he went there, but that's in the East. Their, you know, their counterpart is the, the divine liturgy, you it's know, the so divine it's, liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. Exactly. You know, so that's fair. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's why, I, again, I'm not I'm not ragging on you, Jacob, but it's kind of like the fact that the that we have to use the phrase Reverend Novus Ordo goes to show you the situation. And everything you like about the Reverend Novus Ordo is in, innate in the traditional mass. Like all the things you like about the Reverend Novus Ordo, it's like, well, yeah, dude, that's why I go to the traditional mass because all of those things are automatic there. Here's a question for the whole viewing audience that maybe can help me with this one. So we heard this idea of Benedict saying mutual enrichment. What did the Latin mass get? <laughs> I'll, you know what no no no. i'll tell you what they got what did we get what did we they, get you did get something um okay so i honestly i i feel more at home at a diocesan latin mass than i do at a society latin mass and i have no problem with the society uh -huh. like i have no problem with the society None. I, I still go on yeah. occasion, right? You're, you're, you're going to be there in like, what, like a couple of years or something whenever, when there's no more options. <laughs> you're right. But there's something about um, the diocesan Latin mass that I feel more comfortable. Like there's, there's it's some, more, it's every, more natural on the like um, subsidiarity level. Yeah. And it's like, th there is something to the not getting a dirty look. If your wife forgot her veil, you know, when, when I go to the society, like, my daughters don't feel comfortable there, you know, because they're they like, weren't, they, weren't, they weren't looking at your wife. They were looking at you, bro. They were like, yeah, oh, no, I guy. know <laughs> they're judging me that my wife he's, forgot he, her he, mail. He's the guy, so he's it's the like, guy grabbed, he grabbed his, his when you go to the, when you <laughs> go to the diocesan Latin mass, it's like 99% of people are wearing veils, but like people, you just, there's something less judgy. <laughs> so here's, here's my question. Here's my question. I don't know if that that argument works though, only because why? And that I, might just be subjectively at my local cha chapel. Yeah, I think it might be subjective because it's like I've been to SSPX ones where I've thought, dang, my diocesan TLM is a little bit more strict than this. So th I think there's a bit of give and take. I there. also think the liturgy at my diocesan Latin mass is more beautiful. The 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 
Yeah, that, that's it's my just a more beautiful liturgy where it's it's a little stale at the chapel, and that might just be subjective again with the priest celebrating it. Sure. Yeah. Here's my question, though. So I think when Benedict is talking about mutual enrichment, there's probably a certain sense where, you're tr where that's true, where you're talking about like in a diocesan setting. But let's just take it square, missile to not missile. liturgically though. It's yeah. it's more of a, a feeling, and it's, it's very well, subjective. So we didn't. We found out everyone. Anthony's a phenomenologist. It's just about, <laughs> the, it's just about the feeling for him. I'm He's very just, sentimental. Well, my question is just like when we take the missiles. Put them next to each other, right? And we say, okay, mutual enrichment. We always talk about the, the Novus Ordo gets Latin, it gets Gregorian chant, kneeling, altar, altar boys only, all this type of stuff. But what did, in the missal context, the Latin mass get? Oh, nothing. That's the point. I can't. The yeah, only, no, the no, only, no, liturgically, nothing. Liturgically, the there was no enrichment from the Novus Ordo. I, I, I'm talking more of a subjective sure, feeling yeah. thing, you know? It's. Yeah. The Where only, I think if it if, if we never had the Novus Ordo, that subjective feeling thing would just be at the parish I'm going to anyway. It's just, this yeah. is, you know, it's so it is very subjective. I, I think that the enrichment only could have gone to the Novus Ordo being a little more reverent. And I see that <clears throat> at my diocesan parish that celebrates both forms. The Novus Ordo is much more reverent because mm -hmm. the priest celebrates the traditional mass and doesn't want altar girls now and doesn't want, he celebrates it or at Orientum, but that is such a rarity. It's only at, this is the only enrichment that goes on is one way. And that's why Benedict wanted it though. He wanted the Novus Ordo to be enriched by the traditional mass. Yeah. The only argument. It wasn't mutual that, enrichment. No, it wasn't. And the only arguments that I've really ever heard to counter is, well, maybe we could have the readings in the vernacular. It's like, well, they were already doing that pre-council you know sean i think that's a thing people say it's it's not true and it, it, maybe it was at one time yeah i'm it's telling a, you man that is you, not the, go ahead. let me say something about this argument i don't mean to cut you off let me say well, well no, no no i'll say sean i know sean just went to his first traditional mass recently oh, so so that's which great. is a beautiful thing but sean really listen listen to what nick's gonna say here so here you'll hear an argument sometimes they'll say well when I, this is generally older individuals will say, well, when I was a kid, the Latin mass was, you know, like a priest was rushing it. It would be like a 10 minute mass. No one was participating. There'd be like one person in the front with a missile and they know when to stand and sit. No one else knew what they were doing. It was all just rosaries and stuff like that. Right. You hear that. Now, what's interesting to me about that argument is that those same people will say, don't generalize the Nova Sordo. We can have a reverent Nova Sordo. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they, they like to generalize free Vatican II traditional masses. Um, but yeah, so I would say, Sean, uh, first off, great that you went, uh, keep doing it. And cause you'll notice a, a legitimate change, especially as you, it goes on. So keep doing that. But what you need to know and find out is I would argue that on the objective Catholic level, the traditional Latin mass is going to promulgate truer and deeper participation because remember we're body and soul, right? But it's what the participation of the Nova sort of, while it obviously should be internal primarily it's just a lot of people repeating things where hey, do you do you think before uh okay so like the modern iteration of the traditional mass almost everyone mm -hmm. there has a missile like yeah. i love having my missile and reading along with the priest and i sometimes when he, like i'll re when he's reading the epistle i'll read the english while he's reading the latin mm -hmm. and it's like i really do i participate infinitely more at the traditional mass than i do at the novus ordo my i cringe at the novus ordo when i'm at the traditional mass i want to know exactly where that priest is and once you look sean when you first go you're lost right you don't have a clue where you are and, mm -hmm. and i would say get the benedictus thing because the benedictus pamphlet they give you it's it's basically the magnificat for the latin mass you actually just it takes you you don't have to know how to flip back and forth in the missile once you learn that then you get the missile and you actually will learn when to flip to the red when to flip to the propers when to do all that like it will it takes a little bit of time and dedication you will have a devotion to the mass that you never had at the novus ordo i promise you it's such a beautiful experience once you actually participated and i can tell you that because my wife my wife could not stand the traditional mass when she first started going and it took about a year for her i mean that's a lot of masses but after a year now my wife is 
she's so devoted to the traditional mass. She adores it. She loves it. She can't go back to a Novus Ordo. And that's every person I know that spends like a d significant amount of time at the traditional mass cannot go back to the Novus Ordo because they just don't feel Catholic anymore. Yeah, no, I remember, I don't know if I've ever told this story, but I remember <clears throat> one time it was after I had gone to the Latin mass for, I think it was a year and a half. <clears throat> I remember on a weekday, right, where there's no traditional mass, going to a Novus Ordo with the expressed intention of just seeing what would happen after being used to the Latin mass for so long. And I remember going to sitting in the back room. It was pure experimentation for me. And I remember by the end of it thinking, this feels so wrong. Like it just, so it, Protestant. it just feels so wrong. And, yeah. and I'm not trying to say that in the sense of I'm, I'm calling people out. I'm just saying like, for me in that moment, subjectively, I was it feels look, and I'll, and I'll tell everyone in the chat that, that goes to the Novus Ordo. This is not a judgment. To, look, it's not anybody's fault that the bishops promulgated the Novus Ordo mass. It's not your fault that your local parish celebrates the Novus Ordo. It's just not your fault. It has, it's not a judgment towards anybody. It's just, when you go to a traditional mass for a significant amount of time and then you try to go back to the Novus Ordo, you feel like you're so you feel like a fish out of water. You're like this. I don't know. This doesn't feel like you just. Ah, yeah, no, it, it, it becomes so weird. And that's why uh, I know you probably had this experience, uh, maybe a, a portion in your past. But it's like when you try to evangelize to non-Catholics, to your Protestant friends. And you take them to the Nova Sordo and you find, wow, I'm spending more time apologizing for all of the things. <laughs> Which, uh, so, all right. So Short Farrell says, Margo, I don't even know where to put my ribbons. I don't know like the proper placement for ribbons. I put the red ribbon where the red is in the in the missile. I use the purple for where the propers are. And then I keep the other ribbons for specific devotionals that I like in the missile because there's so many beautiful prayers, especially in the Father Lassant's missile. So I don't know if I'm using them properly, but I know how to use the missile at this point. Yeah, so I honestly should just do a a whole video on how to use the missile. I've been asked. You should. That I would watch that on my show. But like, if you guys just get a missile, so this is mine, right? I like to use the St. Andrew's missile because that's lots of cool devotionals in it. But it's really as simple as this. It's just three basic steps. Find one ribbon that goes in the portion that says the ordinary of the mass. The ordinary That's of the mass is that mass that just never changes, right? It's the stuff that we always say. Start with the Asperger's me. So you yeah. find where the Asperger's me is and you put your one, I put the red ribbon there because the red is the rubrics. Yeah, that, that works for you. Whatever works for you as long as you know. Um, some of the missiles uh, layouts are different. So like for instance, mine, the middle color is green, right? And the red one's the first one. It's just find whatever works for you. But just Number one, put one in that in that area because that's going to be the main area that you're looking for. If you're on a Sunday or a feast day, all of the stuff in the mid in the front, right? So all it starts that. with Advent, right? So it starts with the beginning of the liturgical year, which is Advent, and then it takes you through, and you start seeing you go through. You go through Lent, then you go through Easter, then you start going through Pentecost, and you get the time after Pentecost. So it starts like this is the order of the Mass, and it and it stays the same every single year. So you get one missile, and it lasts forever. Exactly. So you just put a just put one ribbon in the front somewhere, and just kind of go Sunday by Sunday, right? It's very it's very simple. Most of your parishes will say that this is the you know like the upcoming one, the sixth Sunday after Pentecost or something like that. Yeah, and Joe, then, post, post the link, Joe, just in case anybody yeah, wants to watch it. That's a good one as well. You Check out that video. And then the third one is that you just take an, a third ribbon and then just put it in the back. And the good thing about the back is that it, most missiles just have the date, right? So whatever the date is, just look at your watch, look at your phone, right? What is the date? And just go from there. And oftentimes, big important thing, right? I don't... I know there's some public schoolers out there, so I might be saying something controversial, but there's these things called instructions, right? Um, that you'll see oftentimes in the missile and they'll say, you know, this proper is on this page, right? So go and find uh, that page, right? And then just kind of go with it. And so it's very simple. It definitely takes maybe two or three times. Thankfully, I remember whenever I first went, I don't know what was going on. I guess it was a grace, but I just knew how to immediately use it. Oh, really? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. No, I, I, I had to play around with it a little bit, but the, but once you know what, like as long as you're going to mass every week, if you don't know where you're supposed to be in the propers, there's a there's an app called um, what's the app? Uh, it's called iMass. So it's a, it's an app called iMass, and it gives you um, the mass of the day, the liturgical books. You hit liturgical books, you hit missile, and it'll tell you at the top. It'll say, okay, so. 
it'll say like today is Saint uh, Henrique Emperor. Oh, wait, where is it? <laughs> for today's actual saint for 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 today today. Yeah, it'll actually tell no, you. For, for, for today, well, today's not Sunday, so it's not going to tell me the Sunday. But it'll yeah, tell you if it's the, what Sunday after Pentecost it is. So if you don't know where you are on your missile, it'll tell you which Sunday after Pentecost you are. You going to IMAS? Then you'll know where to go in the propers. So I do the propers. I do where the actual uh, the you know the the regular mass is. Then in the back of the missile, there's usually like prayers after communion prayers of thanksgiving there's you have your act of contrition in there you have every prayer you have an examination of conscience in there it's such a beautiful book that even if you have even if you go to the novus ordo get a traditional missile there's prayers in there that you will just be so happy that you have that missile you know i just thought anthony this sunday is what what you uh, the second anniversary of traditionis custodis is it yeah july 16th so the this feast of our lady mount carmel <laughs> Yeah, we should. We should. Francis celebrate. always gives you the greatest news on Marian feast days, doesn't he? <laughs> I'm going. I'm going to make a troll video, so you guys go over and subscribe to the traditional Thomas. But I'm going to make a troll video on Sunday called <laughs> "Traditionus Custodis Celebration." It's just going to be me going to the Latin mass. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I, we're gonna we're gonna let Nick go eat, but yeah. So Christ the King was moved to the end of November, which signifies like Christ becoming king at the end of time. Whereas Christ the King feast was always around Martin Political. Luther's Martin Luther's uh, revolt, which is right after like all, all it's right after All Souls Day. I think the traditional right. Yeah, no, it, it's it's the last Sunday of October, so it's right. Yeah, it's right around then. Of uh, I think it's actually usually the so, date of Luther's Reformation. I'm talking to my friend. It's, I mean, we're on a private one. Why would matter? Car alarm. All right, we're gonna wrap up now. I'll 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 take my son's car alarm's going off. I gotta go take a look at that. So, oh, dude, we did it. another hour on here. Holy cow! We did we we started at nine. We it's essentially mid- we essentially did a. A three hours. We did a three hour show. Um, I, dude, I, I could talk to you f- forever, man. You gotta, I, I, as soon as you come back, I want to get you back on, man. We'll all be praying for you while you're there, man. I, I think it's such an awesome thing that you're doing. Yeah, it's, it should be fun. So, uh, yeah, I'll keep you, I'll keep you guys posted uh, a little bit on uh, social media about my uh, adventure, but uh, for the most part, it'll be off, but it'll be great to be back. If you got little clips, if you do anything on your iPhone, you could send me little clips that I could like post to to the Telegram or something. Send me stuff. I would love to. I would love to have updates from you while you're there. If you even could just shoot me a text and say, "Hey, man, we're two weeks in, and I'm I'm keeping up with my hundred pages a day." Just give us little updates, man. Everybody here really I'm telling you, our my whole audience really, really loves that, loves when you come on, man. I I'm so glad that we're friends. Yeah, that'd be fun. I'll uh, also, uh, if you guys in the audience, go follow my. So I have two channels on Instagram, right? The traditional Thomas, and then also just Nicholas Cavazos. That's my personal one. But I'll be uploading every once in a while some stuff over there, some stories and stuff like that. So I'll send them I to you. I gotta follow you on Instagram. I don't know if I do. Oh, really? Yeah. No, I know that. Uh, I know the Avoiding Babylon channels followed. Oh, okay. If, I, if that follows you, if that's the only one I really use. Then okay. But uh, yeah, go follow me over there, and um, you'll get some updates. I'll also send. Uh, you anthony some personal updates and stuff uh, also send if you guys are part of the meaning of catholic guild uh you'll see some updates in there as well so uh yeah it should be uh it should be fun i'm 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 interested to see what i will like how i'm gonna walk out because a part of me thinking like after three thousand pages of saint thomas i'm probably just gonna weep because i'm like dang i've like the master is he's he's done saying his speech to me you know I, I want an interview when you come back, though. I want to hear all about this this month long thing you're doing. So when you get back, I know you got to do your thing with being a Catholic and stuff, but I want an interview. I want to talk to you about that that whole experience you had. Sure, yeah, let's do it. Nick, thank thank you for coming on with me, dude. You 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 always come through for me. I always have a good time talking to you guys. Guys, go go subscribe to Traditional Thomist. I'll have to I'll have to put like I'm maybe I'll like the stuff that wasn't personal on here. Maybe I'll put a clip up on YouTube for people so that we can at least put this ending on where i'm promoting your channel we didn't even promote anything on the other one so oh it's all good <laughs> <laughs> then i gotta come on your channel one time yeah for real i just need it when i get back i have so many potential interviews planned so i'd love to get you and rob on i know i'm trying to get uh the big the big thomas uh dr t on so uh, that should be uh if we can ever get I'll put him in a good on. word i'll shoot him a dm so when before you before you ask him let me know and i'll shoot him a dm and i'll say hey talk to this kid man this kid's amazing <laughs> okay we'll do i'll definitely do that that should be fun all right we're gonna wrap this up guys guys thanks for checking this out man this is fun
And I will see you guys on Tuesday. Tuesday, I got Jay Dyer on. And then Thursday, Father Isaac. So we got an exciting week next week. And uh, we'll see everybody later. Uh...